literature, her work as an historian, and a contribution to our understanding of indigenous issues, cultural diversity, equity and social justice, and the environment through story." Unquote. Nadia's biography of Charmian Cliff, the life and myth of Charmian Cliff, won the Age Nonfiction Book of the Year Award in 2001, and the New South Wales Premier's Award for History in 2002. Her most recent book is the memoir, Her Mother's Daughter, and I think Her Mother's Daughter is on the table somewhere. And she and Meredith Bergman are working on a book about 1968. Nadia Whitman. Thanks, Anthony. It's about the 60s more broadly, really, and okay. we find the 60s as going from 65 to 75, so we have a bit of latitude in it. So, thank you very much. It's really great to be here, and of course, I always begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the area, and I'm actually, who is it here? <laughs> <laughs> I need to look it up before I come to a class. Darryl, 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 of course. Okay, thank you, you folks. So, I acknowledge the Darrell people, past and present, of this area. One of the most well-known sayings of the 60s, and I'm sure it's possibly been said once or twice this morning, <coughs> is the claim that the personal is political. But it goes without saying, I think, that at any time and in any context, people bring their personal history to their political life. What interests me is people who turn against the values of their class and their family upbringing. What provokes these radical turnarounds? Meredith and I are currently collaborating on a book that tells the story of the awakenings or trigger moments that caused a number of young people in the 1960s to become radicalised. In my own case, the process of political radicalisation appeared to be remarkably quick. But of course, it was a reaction to the personal history that had preceded it. So I'm going to present myself today as a kind of micro case study of what could happen to a person getting radicalised in the 1960s, why it might happen. I often say that the Vietnam War saved my life, and I mean that literally. I sometimes think that if I hadn't got involved with the protest movement and with the sense of hope that it brought, the hope that I could help change the world, I might have killed myself before I was 21. Only a few months ago, a cousin of mine, commenting on what I was like when I first became radicalised, said, you seemed so angry. Fifty years after the events of 1968, my cousin was still clearly troubled by the change that had occurred in me. The sort of change that's exemplified by this before and after shot. I may not look angry in my school photo, but that's only because I had learned not to show my emotions. In fact, I was wild with years of bottled up fury and hatred and dread. I've recently told this story at some length in the memoir of my mother's life, her mother's daughter. I was the only child of comparatively elderly parents who had met and married while they were both working with displaced persons and refugees in post-war Germany. In 1949, my mother, an Australian nurse, had returned to Sydney seven months pregnant with me. My father, a British doctor, didn't arrive until I was nine months old. They had never lived together in Germany, and now when they did so, the relationship rapidly proved to be a disaster. My father was a gambler whose financial situation went up and down, but my early childhood was during a period of affluence. We lived in a big house on Sydney's North Shore. Of course, something else happened in 1949, as well as my birth. Towards the end of the year, there was a federal election. Like all of my generation, I would spend my entire childhood and adolescence under a Liberal country party government. As my father sat behind the Sydney Morning Herald at the breakfast table, checking the sliding value of his shares, my mother, cooking eggs and bacon at the stove, used to encourage me to break the terrible silence by spelling out the headlines on the front page. Menzies, 
was one of the first words I learned to read at a glance. <laughs> In the 1930s, my mother had regularly gone to the Communist New Theatre and had vociferously opposed Pig Iron Bob. I don't know what her attitude to him was in the 1950s, but she retained her internationalist vision of social justice that had led her to work in the post-war period with the aid agency UNRWA and with the International Refugee Organisation. Within the middle class enclave of this North Shore house, the painful legacy of the war was made manifest by the presence of the people who lived in the apartment around the other side of my bedroom wall. So around that side of the house, there was a separate flat or apartment. These neighbours were known collectively as the Poles. They were former Polish displaced persons whom my mother had known in the camps and who were invited to live with us until they found their feet in the new land. That's me with one of them called Paniadosia. Paniadosia had moved on by the time my memory kicks in but I remember toddling around to the apartment and visiting other Polish refugees. And I remember them hearing at night the sound of them crying or talking or sometimes laughing through my bedroom wall. There was and there is another reason why I felt connected with Europe's post-war refugees. At a time when Australian girls were called Susan, Anne and Jennifer, it was beyond the pale to have a name like Nadia even if it was followed by the Anglo surname Wheatley. When I went to Gordon Nursery School, my classmates called me a repo and said they weren't allowed to play at my place because there were poles there. Of course, this ostracism was trivial in the extreme compared to the racism suffered at that time by Aboriginal Australians or by girls such as my friend Josepha Zobsky who, like me, had been born in Australia in 1949, but who was truly the child of Polish refugee parents and who spent the first 10 years of her life in a Nissan hut in the Villawood Migrant Centre. However, we must take our radical lessons where we find them. And I'm eternally grateful to these North Shore children who so perfectly imitated the political beliefs voiced by their parents. <laughs> Looking back, I see this as the first moment of my radical awakening. By the time I was seven, we had moved from the North Shore to one of the new Housing Commission suburbs of the South West, and I was attending an Anglican girls' school in Stratford. 1956 was the year of sewers and Hungary. It was also the year when television came to Australia. My father, who was always more of a gambler than a businessman, saw this as the perfect moment to give up a lucrative medical practice and plunge his money into an open-air picture theatre in an outer suburb of Brisbane. <coughs> At the same time, he ran off with one of his patients, <coughs> but not before attempting to have my mother committed to a loony bin. Over a period of two years, I lost her three times. On two occasions, she came back to me after some months, but on the third occasion, I was sent to stay at the house of one of my classmates. After I'd been there for 17 days, I was told that my mother had gone to live with Jesus in heaven. I was told nothing else. For the next seven years, I was a foster child. I was bullied and abused. My foster father was one of Australia's most senior captains of industry. He was also one of the faceless men behind the Liberal Party. My foster mother ruled the household through a draconian system of bad marks, which were publicly recorded in the bad mark chart on the kitchen wall. One crime, to give you an example of what you could get a bad mark for, was to read a book while the sun was shining. <laughs> Obliged to follow this strange system of law and to be unnaturally good in the home of strangers, I learned to conceal pain as well as anger. I was 16 years old in January 1966 when I made my escape to Women's College at the University of Sydney. Through that first year at university, I was like a creature let out of a cage. 
I was running wild and yet lacking the necessary knowledge about how to survive outside captivity. As I entered my second year, the impact of my mother's death, delayed for so long, overwhelmed me. Voiceless, I had never been able to ask what she died of. Powerless, I didn't even know where she had been buried or indeed where her ashes were. Subsumed by grief, I spent a lot of that year, my second year at university, in my room at Women's College with a do not disturb sign on the door. Like a vampire, I stopped going out in the daytime. If I attended lectures at all, I went to the repeats given for the evening students. As depression slowed down my metabolism, my body swelled up like a barrage balloon. On a perpetual diet, I never went to college dinner. Hours later, finding myself to be starving, I would roam the corridors looking for the bread that was from the sliced loaf provided in the pantry of every wing. And so, in the early hours of one morning in the winter of 1967, clad in my red vanilla nightshirt, thick socks and gum boots, the Ugg boot had not yet been invented, I was galumping along the bottom reed corridor when a door flew open. As I say this, I can still see Meredith Bergman standing in front of me, her silver hair, which was curly in those days, seeming to fizz with electricity, and I can still hear her squeak of relief as she realised that the sound outside her door was not a marauding college boy, but a fat girl in gumboots. <laughs> Within moments, we were eating Vegemite on toast together, as we would do over many nights over the coming months. Although Meredith was not in any self-imposed retreat from the world, far from it, she shared my habit of staying up all night and sleeping until lunchtime. At the time, this seemed to be the only thing we had in common. But as I look back now, I see that the real connection was that we both did not fit in at Women's College. The difference was that Meredith, who came from a loving and supportive family, could afford to look like a misfit. Whereas I thought I wanted to be the same as the other girls, but I didn't know how to do it. It would be in the next year, 1968, that we would really make ourselves outcasts in college society. From this point, I can start dating things from the box of newspaper clippings that I've dragged around with me for 50 years. So I know that it was on Wednesday, the 19th of June, 1968, that Meredith arrived towards the end of lunch in the college dining hall and joined the table of girls with whom I was sitting. The topic of discussion was the usual women's college fair. Who had been invited to the Paul's formal, by whom, and what they planned to wear. Out of the blue, Meredith suddenly asked the assembled 20 or so girls at the long refectory table, does anyone want to go on a demonstration this afternoon? I heard my lone voice piping up, I'll come. As I now read newspaper articles from that day, I learned that what was called a large but unsensational front lawn meeting had resolved to send a deputation of five students to wait on the Minister for Labor and National Service to protest about new regulations which obliged the university administration to dog in 20-year-old male students to the government. At the lunchtime meeting on campus, some students had decided to support the deputation by simultaneously holding a peaceful protest outside the minister's office in Martin Place. I knew nothing of politics. I never read the newspaper. I never watched television. My world was located somewhere between Beowulf and the, and the wasteland. What's the demonstration about? I asked Meredith as we made our way to the bus stop on City Road. Conscription, she said. My knowledge of Vietnam was so minimal that I thought the place was an island, but I didn't need to know anything to know that conscription was wrong. It was mid-afternoon when the two of us joined a hundred other students, mostly male, on the footpath in front of the building that housed the Commonwealth officers. As the deputation of student representatives prepared to go into the building to see the minister, 
there was a groundswell of feeling that we should all accompany them. Making my way with the others through a tiled vestibule and into a lift, I had no sense of doing anything illegal. This was a public building after all, and it was still office hours. On the seventh floor, a corridor took us directly into a large open plan office. The minister wasn't in, but nobody seemed deterred. Over the next few minutes, the lift brought more and more protesters up from the street, and at the same time, groups of office workers were catching the lift back down. They seemed happy to be getting an early mark. By four o'clock, there were 92 of us in the office. Once the occupation was in progress, a certain level of tedium set in. Finally, a lookout stationed at the window shouted that a couple of paddy wagons had arrived in Martin Place. Sit down, voices shouted when a dozen policemen began to approach along the corridor. Everybody, sit down. I joined all the other people who were flopping onto the carpet. It was a bit like an impromptu game of musical chairs, except there weren't any chairs or any music. An elderly policeman introduced himself before telling us that he was going to read the Crimes Act. After that, he said, I will ask everyone to leave the building. Anyone who remains will be liable to two years jail. Like my foster mother's system of bad marks, the Crimes Act seemed to me to be quite surreal. How could sitting on the floor be against the law? It was just as crazy as getting a bad mark for reading while the sun was shining. So I didn't consciously make a decision as to whether I should leave or stay. I just stayed. After years of being punished for nothing, I was immune to threats. We shall not be moved, people started singing. I had never heard the song before, but within moments my voice was joining in. Link arms, someone shouted. We all did. There was a bit of a scramble. Working in pairs, the police began to drag demonstrators down the corridor to the lift. When they pick you up, let your body go limp, the skinny boy sitting beside me recommended. You're heavier that way, he explained. I had never before thought of being heavy as an asset. <laughs> we shall overcome, we all sang. Time fell into a walk as I waited for my turn. I had no idea what was happening to the other demonstrators when they arrived on the ground floor. Were they indeed being carted off to jail for two years? The question was of no concern to me. Despite the fact that I lived in a constant state of anxiety, I discovered that I had no fear at all of the police or the powers of the state. Deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome some day. I sat and I sang until it was my turn. We've got a baby whale this time, one of the policemen observed as we entered the lift. I was mortified. After the short descent to the ground floor, I was dragged across the tiled vestibule and I was tossed down the steps, more like an undersized minnow than a whale. As I landed on my bottom in Martin Place, it was somewhat belatedly that I realised that I was not under arrest and about to go to jail for two years, and nor was anybody else. Some of the other demonstrators cheered as I struggled to my feet. It was the first time in years that I had felt approval for something I had done. When I think of that crucial, indeed crucible year, of 1968, there always springs into my mind a couplet from Wordsworth's poem on the French Revolution. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. The poet might have been writing about me. As I ran around the streets at night, sticking posters onto telegraph poles and painting graffiti on the walls, I didn't simply feel alive in a new way, but for the first time in many, many years, it actually seemed as if I was young. Having missed out on being a teenager, I was having fun. One, two, three, four, I shouted as I marched through the city. We don't want your fucking wall. I'd been silenced for so long that to use my voice was in itself a form of liberation. To open my mouth and let years of frustration and, yes, anger burst out. 
link arms. After being accustomed for so long to being alone and afraid, I loved the physical contact with demonstrations. The sense of being held in an embrace that went beyond sexual. Feeling other people in solidarity with me and myself in solidarity with other people. This made me feel safe, as I had not done for over a decade. Pink today, bacon tomorrow. While I did not seek out violence, nor did I mind the push and shove that occurred as a flying wedge of male authority figures knocked me to the ground. Physical pain was so much better than the other kind, but soon the other kind was to hit me full force. On the afternoon of Friday, the 2nd of August, 1968, draft resistors Mike Jones and Jeremy Gilling were arrested when they tried to enter the cinema that was showing the Pentagon's propaganda movie, The Green Berets. As Mike and Jeremy were hustled into the paddy wagon, Meredith and another young woman, Marie, and I sat down in George Street in front of the vehicle and were arrested for obstruction. You can see from the newspaper clipping on the right that what we were involved in was a city riot. So if you <laughs> what a riot looks like, <laughs> that's what it looks like. In the photograph that appeared on the front page of that evening's edition of The Sun, I looked like a girl kneeling demurely at prayer. It was after I was bailed out and got back to my college room that the sky fell in. Hearing the pressure on duty, shouting that there was a phone call for me, I hurried down to the phone booth in the entrance lobby of my wing. I can still see the white pin board inside the phone booth with the numbers of the men's colleges helpfully scrawled onto the listing of emergency numbers. I can smell the musty smell of the telephone receiver into which so many secrets had been whispered over the years. I can hear the sound of young women chatting to each other as they came in the door from evening lectures. Simultaneously, I heard the voice of one of my aunts saying into my ear, when Jesus took your mother to live with him in heaven, I couldn't understand how he could do such a thing. But now I know it was to save her from ever knowing she had a commie for a daughter. <laughs> oh, how she would have hated you. This was the beginning of a second death of my mother, far worse than the first. One of the phrases of the 60s was the generation gap. Across Australia, parents were at a loss to understand their children, and children were loggerheads with their parents. For an orphan, I suddenly had seemed to have a great many people who regarded themselves as being in loco parentis to me. Resurrecting my mother as some sort of anti-communist crusader, my relatives sought to blackmail me into submission, or at least into reverting to being the submissive little nothing that I had been before. Over the coming years, I would be attacked by way of letters and phone calls, as well as face-to-face -face arguments, in which I would be under siege from numerous aunts and uncles and cousins. This actually happened at a family funeral only a few months ago. Always, they would use my mother against me. Of course, this attempt at control only pushed me further to the left. A couple of years after this, after 1968, Janice Joplin would express how I felt when she sang that freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. I came to feel that if indeed my mother would have hated me for being a commie, then I might as well be as bad as bad could be. Thank you.